Do you read reviews on Amazon? Some are helpful, but some are just plain weird, right? Now picture this. You're in the market for a new padlock. You find one that looks pretty good, and when you check the reviews, you read this. Solid locks have five on a shipping container. Won't stop them, but sure will slow them down till they are too old to care. Okay, or say you're shopping for a chainsaw and see this review. Works excellent. Getting the neighbor to stand still while you chase him with it is hard enough without an easy to use chainsaw. And how about this one for a folding shovel? Keep in car for when you have to hide the bodies and you forget the full size shovel at home. Okay. What if I told you the man who wrote those reviews wasn't joking around? He was South Carolina's most notorious serial killer, Todd Colehep, and he used those products to torture and kill seven people and keep women locked in a Konex shipping container where no one could hear them scream. You'll never look at the reviews the same way again. Let's get into this. Good to see you. I'm Chris, and this is True Crime Recaps. Even serial killers have a day job, and Todd Kolhep was no exception, except his job got him access to your home, your personal life, and gained your trust, because he wasn't just South Carolina's most frightening mass murderer, he was also one of the state's most successful realtors. But as good as he was at selling houses, he was even more skilled at getting away with murder. Even joked about it, saying, My golf game is weak, but my killing game is strong. Here's what he meant by that. In the middle of almost a 100 isolated acres of forest and fields, he kept a green 30 by 15 foot metal shipping container hidden under a canopy of trees. Was it storage of some kind? Yes, but only in the most sinister definition of the word. On Labor Day weekend in 2016, Charlie Carver and his girlfriend, Kayla Brown, had dinner plans after work, but they never made it to the restaurant. Their boss made sure they never left the job. Kayla cleaned houses for Todd's real estate agency. Sometimes she brought a friend to help if he needed yard work done. Sometimes Charlie joined her. But her last job was a little different. Todd offered her cash to do some yard work on his personal property. That was nothing new, but he had an unusual request. Bring Charlie with you. Should that have sent up a red flag? At the time, it didn't. Todd owned 95 acres of dense forests and fields out in rural Spartanburg County, South Carolina, about an hour away from Charlie and Kayla's apartment in Anderson. He said he only wanted people he knew and trusted working for him out there. Serial killer translation? Come alone, don't leave witnesses. The property was created to be the perfect killing field. 95 isolated acres surrounded on all sides by a chain link fence and a locked gate. Kayla and Charlie made the drive out early and met Todd at the gate, ready to remove some brush and do some cleaning. There was no reason to suspect the job would be anything but ordinary. But in hindsight, Kayla told Dr. Phil maybe it was a little strange when he locked the gate behind them after they drove in. What she didn't know at the time was that Todd, the real estate broker, was about to turn into Todd, the serial killer. When they got to his remote outbuildings, he didn't keep up the good guy routine for long. Only minutes after they pulled in without warning, he shot Charlie three times in the chest. Kayla was frozen with fear, which is exactly what Todd had in mind. He grabbed her by the back of the neck and marched her into his Konex storage container, threatening her that she would end up like Charlie if she didn't obey. Not like she had much choice. He had a makeshift mattress, a flashlight, and supplies ready to go. She was gagged, cuffed, and chained to the wall by her neck. The most dangerous predators are the ones we don't expect, and Todd Colehep was the last person you'd expect to be afraid of. He was a 45-year-old single successful real estate broker with two properties, luxury cars, and his pilot's license. On the surface, he seemed like a catch. He'd even been dating a woman named Holly on and off for 10 years. But dig a little deeper, and you'd know what kind of a monster he really was. The man was born angry. In preschool, he was already attacking other kids. In first grade, he killed the family goldfish with bleach. By nine, he'd been institutionalized for his extreme anger issues and antisocial behavior. But the treatment didn't take. Neighbors described him as a devil on a chain. His one hobby was collecting weapons. You don't have to be a child psychologist to know that's not a good sign. 
By 15, he was living with his father in Arizona. That's where he took his first human victim. She was a 14-year-old neighbor girl. He kidnapped and raped her at gunpoint, then threatened to kill her and her family if she told. Fortunately, she was brave enough to speak up. That twisted crime got him more than a decade in an adult prison and a spot on the sex offender registration list. But when he was released, it was like it all went away. It was way too easy for him to start over. He moved back home to South Carolina where he earned two degrees and his realtor license. How is something like that possible? All it took was one little lie on the paperwork, and by the time Kayla and Charlie drove onto his property in 2016, Todd was the face of one of the most successful real estate agencies in town, and no one knew about his dark past. But back to that Labor Day weekend. With Kayla locked down in the shipping container, Todd wrapped Charlie in a blue tarp and used the bucket of his tractor to move and bury his body. With him out of the way, Kayla was alone and vulnerable, but there was still the question of what to do with Charlie's white Grand Prix. If anyone was looking, it would be easy to spot with a helicopter or drone. When it was finally found two months later, it had been spray-painted brown and camouflaged with trees and branches. Todd had no intention of letting anyone find his prize until he was finished with her. He planned to keep Kayla all to himself for years, as long as she did what he wanted. She gave Dr. Phil a glimpse of her days in captivity. Every afternoon and evening, Todd traveled from his home in nearby Spartanburg out to her cage in the country so he could, quote, play with his toy. His routine went like this. Unlock her cage, take her into the main building where he had a makeshift kitchen, bathroom, and bedroom. Then feed her, rape her, and let her use the bathroom. Every few days, he'd even let her shower, but she was never out of restraints. According to Kayla, Todd explained the concept of Stockholm Syndrome to her. He was betting on the idea that after enough time, she would fall in love with him and they could have a life together. Or what he thought of as a life. His dream for their future together was to keep her in a special soundproof room forever. And he made sure she knew that he was the kind of guy that could do it. He bragged about his skills as a killer. And he even promised to teach her how to kill alongside him if she behaved. The man wasn't just evil, he was delusional. He thought he was controlling her because she was the one in chains, but it was Kayla who was playing him. All she needed was time. With enough of it, her friends and family could find her. From the very beginning, circumstances around their disappearance were strange. For one thing, the couple's Pomeranian, Romeo, was left alone in the apartment. That alone made their case suspicious from the start. They obviously hadn't just picked up and left on a trip, but no one had a clue what might have happened. And then Charlie's Facebook page lit up with strange messages and updates. On September 1st, there was an announcement claiming he and Kayla had gotten married. A week later, another post appeared telling people they were fine. Then things got even weirder. More and more posts popped up. Bizarre messages, violent memes, and references to other missing people. Things Charlie wouldn't ever have posted to his page in a million years. Even friends asking for news about Kayla got creepy responses. Take this conversation submitted to the Daily Beast. Posting as Charlie, Todd told a friend of Kayla she was, quote, with her husband. When the friend asked why Kayla couldn't contact them, Todd answered, she doesn't want to. Then he said, the people that need to know that we are okay know that. Can you imagine how frightening and frustrating those messages must have been? But as strange as they were, none of the communications gave a clue about where Kayla and Charlie were. So why didn't the police just ask Facebook to tell them where the posts were coming from? Well, that would have made things easier, but the court orders necessary to subpoena IP records from Facebook were far outside the scope of the small town South Carolina police. But they stayed on the digital trail and tracked Charlie and Kayla's final cell phone signals all the way to Spartanburg County. But finding them would be like hunting for two needles in a giant haystack. Then they got an anonymous tip. Someone called to say Kayla was buried on a 100-acre property, and the only land fitting that description in the area belonged to Todd Colehep. That's when they focused their attention on him. But who do you think phoned in a tip like that? Did someone know the monster Todd really was? 
He owned TKA Real Estate, a large agency with 11 agents working for him. From being described as a devil when he was a kid to promoting his business with his face on bus benches and billboards all over Spartanburg, he'd pulled off the impossible, masking his true self behind a good old boy public persona. Although, there were signs that something was off. For one thing, he liked to watch porn at the office. That's not exactly realtor of the year behavior, and he got a little too close to his female clients for comfort. He lost some potential clients that way. Even the waitresses at the Waffle House avoided him when they could. When Todd came in, the male cook would have to take his order. But as creepy as he sounds, he was also able to control himself and carry on at least two serious relationships. One was a longtime girlfriend named Holly. Ironically, she loaned him the money to buy the shipping container. He convinced her he needed it to store his weapons and ammunition. She had no idea what he was really doing, although she would later remember an uneasy feeling she always had around him, but he kept that side of himself hidden from her. As a boyfriend, he gave her a lot of attention and made her feel important. What she didn't know was that she was actually his next target. On November 3, 2016, a joint task force of investigators from Spartanburg County and Anderson were serving a search warrant on Todd's land when they found something disturbing in his bedroom. Chains and U-bolts were screwed into the wall next to the bed. Handcuffs were in his drawer, and the house was filled with weapons. It quickly became clear this was no ordinary realtor. Their suspicions led them to the shipping container in the middle of the property. When she heard the noises, Kayla stayed quiet at first. She thought Todd was trying to fool her, testing her to find out if she would call for help or try to escape. It wasn't until she heard the search party call her name that she yelled for help. They used a sledgehammer to break the five locks Todd had raved about on Amazon. They used Todd's own tools to force the doors open. Behind a blanket all the way at the back of the pitch black box was Kayla's makeshift bedroom. They found her sitting up on a thin, dirty mattress with her neck chained to the wall and her ankle chained to the opposite corner. While they set her free with bolt cutters, she told them Todd had shot and buried Charlie. Meanwhile, while his sex slave was being rescued at his property in the country, another group of investigators were serving a search warrant at his house in town. They were in the middle of explaining how they'd tracked his cell phone to the same area as Kayla and Charlie's two months earlier when they got a call. That's when the conversation did a U-turn. Take a listen. While we were here, all right, my sergeant served a search warrant on your property. Okay? We have Kayla. Excuse me? We have Kayla in your property. She was locked in a container. Okay? She has told us that you shot and killed Charlie. Okay, so at this time I'm gonna need you to stand up and put your hands behind he's, your back. He's already killed. Okay. okay, you're under arrest right now for kidnapping. All right, they're continuing to search your property. They're gonna continue to bring, they got cadaver dogs down there. Okay. okay, if you wanna help yourself, tell me where Charlie's at so we can go find his body. That's that's pretty much where we're at right now. Okay. Do you want to help yourself and tell me where the body's at so we can go recover Charlie's body? No, sir. You don't want to? No, sir. Okay. Why'd you shoot him? I didn't shoot anybody, sir. Okay, why'd you lock her in a container in your property? I was talking about. She's on your property right now, locked in a container. They just got her out of a, like a... Um, they called it a shipping conics box. She was locked in a container oh, in a conics oh. box. They got her. We are, we have investigators. We have like 20 investigators on your property right now. Okay. And they have found her in the conics box. So she never left your property. Okay. Okay. You locked her in the conics box, and she has told investigators that you shot and killed Charlie. Okay, so I'm trying to give you an opportunity to help yourself and help us help you find this body. Because Charlie, she's saying Charlie's body, you buried Charlie's body on that property. No, sir. So you're saying you didn't lock her up, you didn't put her in the comics box or anything? No, sir. I'm going to need an Probably a good thing. Go ahead and put him in the back of your car. Sir. 
But here's where the best part comes in. Kayla had played her part so well, Todd had confided in her and bragged about the other murders he'd committed. During the 30-minute trip to the hospital, she spilled all the information she'd stored up over the 65 days she'd been in captivity. And what she had to say would shock investigators. Kayla Brown was the key to solving a quadruple murder cold case known as the Superbike Murders. On November 6, 2003, a customer and his son were making a payment on a go-kart at Superbike Motorsports in Chesney. It was a family-owned and operated motorsports dealership and one of the more popular stores in town. When customers came in, they stayed to chat and check out the latest four-wheelers, dirt bikes, and motorcycles. The father and son were there for a good half hour just looking around, and they weren't alone. He remembered another customer in the store, a man with small eyes, a narrow jaw, and wearing a leather jacket that looked too warm for the weather. Later that night, he learned that the store was the scene of a mass murder. The owner, Scott Ponder, his mother, Beverly Guy, the shop mechanic, Chris Sherbert, and Scott's best friend and service manager, Brian Lucas, had all been gunned down. And there didn't seem to be any reason for it. Nineteen shell casings from a 9mm were left behind, but they were clean. No fingerprints and no real leads. There was thousands of dollars of cash in the store, but nothing was taken. Theories ranged from a possible drug deal gone bad to a deadly love triangle between the owner's wife and a mysterious boyfriend, but every lead turned into a dead end. The case went cold. Then, 13 years later, Kayla had a story to tell. The shooter they'd been hunting for was Todd Kolhep. Since he'd been in the store that day and was a previous customer, he'd actually gotten a police letter asking him to call a tip line if he had any information about the murders. He'd gotten away with it for more than a decade. But what's the point of being an evil genius if no one knows how smart you are? Kayla was literally a captive audience, and he bragged to her about the mass murder, describing how he always wore two pairs of latex gloves when he handled his ammunition, even when he was target shooting. And that's why no fingerprints were found on the shells at Superbikes. But why kill the entire staff? The reason will make your blood run cold. He was a disgruntled customer taking revenge. Take a listen to a clip from his confession. So you bought a GSXR 750 from... Superbike Motorsport. Bought the bike, um, had it 14 days, and it got stolen from the front of the apartment complex. Before it got stolen, I had gone back to them uh, a few days prior to being stolen and told them that I was having a hard time riding it. And I was not so sure I had made a wise decision. Maybe I just, I don't know how to ride it. I'm gonna trade it for something smaller, uh, maybe a 600, or get a, uh, um, just walk away from it, get get out of it. Um, they proceeded to give me, a little on the rude side, about uh, my inability to, to, to ride a, that kind of bike. No one ever taught me. So, I mean, I know how to operate the clutch. They they had dropped it off at the apartment, okay. so they knew they knew exactly where it was stolen because the guy brought it over to me. You said I made a police report. I did. Actually, the law enforcement officer made fun of me. He informed me that that's that's, that's a shame it got stolen before I did. before I got a chance to write you a ticket. And that was the one time I didn't like you guys. I believe it was the manager, the owner's friend. Okay. Um, Kyle's a bit of an asshole. Manager started making some comments about some of my, and I'm, I'm going to have to loosely say because I don't remember the whole thing, but basically, great. Now we'll have something along the lines of we'll have another one to go pick up. And made some comments about the last one being stolen, and, and he said something. There's something about mine was on its way to mine was on its way to Florida. I have no idea was in Florida or why he said that. It was implied that <clears throat> we took your shit. Um, I let it slide for the time being. Got mad about it. <clears throat> kept going out there. Why I kept going to the same bike place, I don't really know. But I'd go out there, sit on the bikes, and listen to these two talk shit. 
I went with the intent. You took the suppressor with you? Mm -hmm. That was one big building. Yeah. I cleared it in under 30 seconds. You what now? I cleared that building in under 30 seconds. You got a little bit proud. But Kayla had more secrets to share. It seems she wasn't the first woman held captive in Todd's shipping container. She was just the only one that lived to talk about it. Megan and Johnny Coxey were reported missing in December 2015. Megan had just bonded out of jail for some petty crime and was looking to start over. Maybe that's why she and her husband agreed to do some work for well-known realtor Todd Kolheb. He picked them up in Spartanburg and drove them out to his property in the country. But when they got there, things took a turn for the worse. Todd claimed Johnny pulled a knife, hoping to rob him. Take a listen as Todd explains what happened next. They saw a guy who had a shitload of money, driving mm -hmm. a car they can't afford. Mm -hmm. They didn't even have a car. And they were going to get something. Okay. Um, so then you shot him how many times? Shot him twice. Okay. In the chest. Okay. He dropped forward. Mm -hmm. He dropped forward. I went around him and put another one through a spinal column. Okay, and you shot her? Not exactly. Okay. Megan was left to deal with the serial killer alone. Here's what happened next from Todd's own mouth. She panicked and then she sat, I told her to sit down. She sat down. Mm -hmm. uh, went ahead and cuffed her, mm -hmm. patted her down, mm -hmm. told her I wasn't going to hurt her. Mm -hmm. Uh, she calmed down, mm -hmm. and I actually took her to the Connex. No, that's not true. I had her lay there for a while. I didn't know what to do with her. Um, I didn't want her in my Connex because I had stuff in there. I didn't know what the hell to do with it. Mm -hmm. Putting her in with my guns is not a good idea. I understand that. Uh, I actually had to go. For the first time, I was having a little bit of a panic of what the hell do I do with her. Mm -hmm. Uh, put her here, put her there, drop her, what the hell to do, do I call the cops, oh shit, I got legal guns, uh, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. Eventually, I went and locked her. I want to say I left her on that floor for a while. I left her on that floor cuffed. I wouldn't mm -hmm. let because I didn't know what to do with her. I didn't want her in the building. Okay. Got the tractor, got it out of there, picked the body up, and was trying to figure out what the hell to do with it. This um, is Johnny's body? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Put her back there to her calm the hell down. Let me rethink this crap. Um, let me see what the hell I'm like, trying to figure out what to do. Mm -hmm. um, when got Johnny went over there and dug a hole. And like I said, you could take the, the tractor and you keep going in and dig. And what you're doing is making a slanted mm -hmm. right. until I can put him here. Right. Um, dug that, stuck him in it, covered it up. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a lot more work than you think. Uh, did that. Went back and dealt with her, tried to figure out what to do with her. Really wasn't sure. Uh, ended up basically leaving her tied up there and went and got some chain. I had chain around. There's lots of chain in that building. Mm -hmm. And then she kept going off the deep end with weird shit and kept talking. And then she kept telling me that she had manic, manic mode or some sort of bipolar lithium crap. I don't know what the hell it was. What made you decide to shoot her? I'll get to that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, I wasn't going to shoot her. Okay. I was going to give her money. Okay. Uh, I don't know why the hell she went the hell off. I held her. I hate the kidnapping part. I'll get another one. I held her there for a couple days. How many days? Five or six. Uh, told her basically that if she would just chill the hell out, mm -hmm. uh, I'll give you an envelope for $4,000. I'll drive you up to damn Tennessee. I'll drop your ass off somewhere. If you got any common sense on this planet, you'll go left and I'll go right. Totally. What right. made that change? What happened? Okay. And I still had to find a way to get away from Ashley, my girlfriend, mm -hmm. long enough to get up out of work, get this person to Tennessee, drop her off, and get home. That's not a, that's not just a couple hour trip. Okay. Uh, the last day I went over there, uh, opened the Connex up. She burned half the freaking building. So then what happened? Uh, well, there was ammo everywhere and stuff everywhere, and she broke the fan. I, I, I got her a fan. She broke the fan. Mm -hmm. Prime. Man, you just can't beat that shit. Two, or two day shipping. Uh, got her one of those. There's a fan in there now, but it came as a two pack. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I had a nose to get air ventilation. Mm -hmm. I got lanterns for so that you have light. Mm -hmm. I did the best I could to make it right. somewhat livable. Mm -hmm. Got her blankets, got her pillows. She lit the damn thing on fire. Went to get her out, and then all of a sudden, it's like I had a caged animal on my hands. I don't know what the hell, what the hell. She went from I'm so freaking happy in the world to be I'm going to go to Tennessee with money, and I'm going to restart my life, and thank you, thank you, thank you, mm -hmm. to bad shit crazy. You know, I just had enough. I walked outside. I was trying to calm down. Trying to figure what the hell to do with her, what to do with her, what to do with her. I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And she walked outside. I walked her, I walked her outside and walked her outside. I put a four in the back of her head. What gun did you shoot her with? Same one. Did you shot? Mm -hmm. Johnny. Johnny with? Mm -hmm. And that's a Glock. And that's the same one you shot? Charlie. 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 It's not my favorite gun. It's just, it's just, it's a, it's a handy gun. It's a handy one. It's very effective. And he wasn't finished yet. As Kayla was detailing the murders he bragged to her about, she told police there was another target he was eyeing. Quote, some girl named Holly he's supposedly planning to kill. Imagine learning your boyfriend is a serial killer, then hearing your name come up as his next victim. Before you find out how this story ends, I have a bizarre detail to share with you. When the bodies of Charlie and Johnny were found, they were both missing their feet. But when they asked Todd about it, he claimed the coyotes must have gotten to them. That wouldn't be the most outrageous lie Todd has ever told. It might even be believable, except medical examiners believe the feet were purposefully removed, but they've never been recovered. Why do you think he would do something like that? In the end, he pleaded guilty to seven counts of murder plus kidnapping and weapons charges. Today, he's serving his seven life sentences at Broad River Correctional Facility in Columbia, South Carolina. His properties were auctioned off. The killing field sold for about 500000 and the house went for about 300000 The proceeds and his other assets were divided between Kayla and his victim's families. But according to Todd, he never did anything to anybody who didn't have it coming. That attitude makes him unique among serial killers. FBI profiler John Douglas spoke to Investigation Discovery about Todd. You probably know John as the inspiration for the Netflix show Mindhunter. So, you know, he knows what he's talking about. And he says Todd is different than any other serial killer he's ever run into. In his opinion, the only other monster with a similar need for retaliation was Dennis Rader, the BTK killer. Here's John's quote about Todd. If he felt you were doing him wrong, he would get even. He's very patient. He would wait months, but he's going to come back. He's going to get you. He was a different breed of cat. You can't argue with that. And that's your recap. Thanks so much for spending some time with us today. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, please subscribe and give this a like so you never miss a recap. Amy and I are here every week. So until next time, take care of yourself. It's crazy out there.